It's been, it's been quite a week, hasn't it? Quite a week. We've, we've been focusing on the fact that it's been a year since um, the sovereign nation of Ukraine, Ukraine was, was um, invaded and all the implications of that, not just for the people of Ukraine, but the people of the whole world. And also the fact that we're not quite sure when it's going to end. So that's been a big focus of, of political debate and um, there have been lots of uh, programs about it on, on the media. And it's been occupying a lot of our prayers as well. Um, another thing that's been occupying our, our prayers is um, a certain leadership debate that's been going on within a certain political party, um, which has also been hitting the headlines, as I'm sure you've noticed. Um, and, and in my mind, the, the debate itself has sort of, it's, it's bared the soul of our nation. It's, it's raised deep questions about, existential questions about who we are and what sort of a society we want to be. Um, I'm not going to go into it, by the way, in case you think, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in my mind, um, it's demonstrated a, a, a certain sort of universal truth that if you want to be a leader, you have to show that what you believe conf conforms to certain establishment accepted values. Um, and you have to demonstrate that not just in what you do, but in what you personally believe, in, in, you know, in terms of who you actually are. And um, if you don't, the press will have a field day. If you say the wrong things, if you cross a line, the press will have a field day. But really, all of this is, is, a, um, is, is, is very, very significant in the way our society operates. And as a student of history, I'm actually convinced that that in every generation, values come to the fore. And they're often different values from the previous generation. Um, and these are, are then accepted by the establishment. And they become a litmus test of, of whether or not you're actually fit for leadership, whether you're fit for office. And things were no different in Jesus' day. The people in Jesus' day were longing for a leader, someone they thought of as the Messiah, God's anointed one. But according to the establishment, anyone aspiring to be the Messiah had to show that they conformed to certain accepted values. And the litmus test in Jesus' day may seem a strange litmus test to us now, but then we're a completely different age and, and culture and, and generation from that. The litmus test as to whether or not you're fit for leadership was how you, what, was, was how you practiced the keeping of the Sabbath. That was how important it was. So we'll see this coming into today's reading. Lindsay is going to be reading it for us. It's from Luke chapter 13, and it's reading from, she's reading from verse 10 to verse 17. Thank you, Lindsay. A crippled woman healed on the Sabbath. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Thanks be to God. 
Shall we pray? Loving Father, please speak to our hearts now through your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love trying to imagine a passage like this. Imagine what it was actually like. So, so let's try and do that now. Let's try and imagine what it was like that day. It was a Sabbath, okay? And the Sabbath was the Jewish day of rest. And, and very much like we do on a Sunday, the Jewish Sabbath was actually the Saturday, still is, whereas we keep the Sunday as the day of rest. But it was sort of similar. Um, people wouldn't work, and instead they'd use the time to think deep things, and, and the faithful would come to the synagogue, they'd gather to the, in the synagogue to worship. And on that particular day, Jesus was the rabbi doing the teaching. And I get the sense that his presence had attracted along others who perhaps didn't usually come. I got that sense just from the way the ruler of the synagogue responds in the passage. So the, the, there's, there's maybe more people than usual come along, and, and they've, you get the sense that they've been attracted because they knew Jesus was there and was going to be speaking, and also they knew that he had been used by God to bring healing and so quite a few people had come along in the hope of being healed. But I also get the sense that um, instead of being pleased that this was the case, all these people coming into his synagogue, the, the ruler of the, the synagogue was feeling a wee bit of resentment. You know, like, you know, well, why don't you come every Sunday, sort of the resentment. And we never have that, do we? We never do that. <laughs> It's sort of one stage short of the, oh, and you're sitting in my pew sort of resentment. Um, so so there's, there's quite a few, it's quite a complex situation. There's all these undercurrents going on. And one of these people, we're told, is a woman who had suffered from a condition which caused over her to be sort of bent over and disfigured. Um, and she'd been suffering from it. Now, I don't know whether it was osteoarthritis. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not quite sure of the terms, but we can imagine the condition and not just that it's a condition that disfigures her, but it's a condition that causes her a huge amount of pain. And she'd been living with it for 18 years. So she comes into the synagogue, and the tradition would be that the, the men sat on one side and the women sat separately, but Jesus notices that she's come in, and he calls her forward. He probably senses why she's come that day, and he calls her forward so everybody can see and there, in front of everybody, he declares that her condition is healed. He declares it. And that in itself is quite a symbolic thing, because there was a thinking in those days that if you suffered from things like that, it was because God had punished you for being a sinner of some sort. So there, right in front of everybody, Jesus is sort of declaring that she's healed. That, so there's no stigma attached to her illness. And then he places his hands upon her, and God heals her. Just imagine you're there watching this happen. You may even have known this person. I mean, I'm assuming she was a local. And you watch her slowly straighten up. And I, and I can only just begin to imagine how she must have felt. I mean, I've recently had a frozen shoulder which has been healed. And every time I do that, my heart rejoices. I think, oh, thank you, God. Thank you. She's been bent double in pain for 18 years. She's now free of pain. She can, she can stand up straight. Her heart rejoices, and she doesn't keep it to herself. She bursts out into praise, praising God for what he has just done. And you'd think that this would generate a lot of thanksgiving and celebration, wouldn't you? Oh, wasn't that wonderful? <coughs> but sadly, this isn't the case with everyone. I'll just read to you again what the ruler of the synagogue says. Verse 14, indignant, indignant. It's not the sort of emotion you'd expect when something like that has just happened. Indignant, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not the Sabbath. Ouch. 
So what's his problem? Well, we've just gone through the Ten Commandments. We know that one of those commandments is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And we've talked about why we have the commandments, because they're a guide to us. They're good for us. It's a good thing to take a break from six days of daily work and do something different on the seventh. It's a good thing to spend time focusing on the deeper things of life, focusing on things of faith, focusing on God. The Sabbath is God's gift to us. It's a time where we can refresh the body and refresh the soul. And it's something which, sadly, many Western cultures have now completely lost sight of. So it's like the gift has been lost. So, the Sabbath is a good thing. But surely healing is also a good thing, even on the Sabbath. And yet, as we see from the synagogue ruler's reaction, it seems to go against the progressive values of the day. Now, I use that phrase, progressive values, because the Pharisees thought of themselves as the progressive party. The Pharisees were a religious grouping that had arisen out of a time where there was general things where people were losing their way, and they felt that they, they had a solution to it. You know, they, they looked around, they saw the corruption in high places, they saw all the, the godless things that were going on, they saw the fact that the Romans were ruling them, that, and all this sort of stuff, and they thought from their reading of the scriptures that they knew the solution to this. And it was quite a simple solution. And it sounded quite good in theory. They believed that for things to change, God had to send his Messiah. And the Messiah would sweep away all the godlessness and, cr and create a society of godliness, a godly society where God's rules applied, known as the kingdom of God. But they believed that before this happened, before God sent his Messiah, the people had to demonstrate their worthiness before God. And they believed that the way to do this was for everyone, every single person, every single member of the Jewish nation, to keep every single one of the Ten Commandments. And there, this, there's this sort of... Um, uh, saying that if every single person kept every single one of the Ten Commandments for just one day, the Messiah would come. They would have demonstrated that they are worthy, and God would reward them by sending the Messiah. And if you like, the litmus test of conformity to the keeping of the Ten Commandments was the keeping of the Sabbath. That's why it was so important. It was the sort of, it was the test. You know, it was showed that it was all working and everybody was going in the right direction so that God could come. Um, and, and we don't know whether the synagogue ruler was actually a member of the Pharisees' party or the Pharisees' sect, but clearly from the way he reacts, he has a lot of sympathy with their teaching. But they had a problem. And their problem was this. If... Keeping the Sabbath meant not working on the Sabbath. How do, you find, how do you define work? How do you know what's work and what's not work? And in response to that, they would got all their scribes and their lawyers really busy, thinking really deep, deep thoughts about what is, is not work. And they'd come up with list after list after list. And this is the work list, and this is the not work list. And people had to know what was on the list. And if they were caught, they were breaking the Sabbath. They were in trouble because they were letting everybody down, and the Messiah wasn't going to come after all. See the thinking. That's what's going on. That's why the Sabbath keeping is so important. And clearly, from what's happened today, and from we know this from other sort of exchanges that take place between Jesus and the Pharisees and other parts of the Gospels, they had decided that healing people was work, and so therefore you couldn't do it on the Sabbath. And to me, this is a demonstration of how somewhere along in the line, in their thinking, 
You know, if you follow a train of thought, everything starts to make sense, and all, it's all logical, and all completely fits into place. But somewhere along the line, they had completely lost the plot. Instead of crying out to God for help, they had begun to rely on their own rule-keeping, their own religiosity. Their faith had become a DIY faith. We can do this ourselves as long as we keep to all these rules type of faith. Salvation had become dependent on what they did, what they didn't do, rather than what God could do for them. And their idea of keeping the, the, the Ten Commandments, if you like, an even more, at an even more subtle level, it was a way of manipulating God. Like, you know, we've kept the Ten Commandments, now you've got to do this, 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 and this. So they sort of lost the plot in all sorts of different ways. And in their desperation to do all these things that they felt, they believed that had to be right and, and had to show God how worthy he was, they had lost sight of who God was and what he's like and what he wants for them and what he wants for the world. And here's the irony. They were so focused on doing all these things so that they could show themselves to be worthy to God and so that the Messiah would come that they were blinded to the fact that the Messiah was already in their midst. And Jesus' response to the synagogue ruler's words, it, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't hold back, does he? <laughs> this, is, this is my paraphrase of what he says. He says to them, this is ludicrous. How can you possibly argue that healing this woman is wrong? when you yourselves would even think twice about helping one of your own animals on the Sabbath. And yet this poor woman has been in agony for 18 years. What are you thinking? You've lost the plot. You've forgotten who God is. You've forgotten why he gave us the Ten Commandments in the first place, which he were given not to control us, not to force us to conform not as a way of manipulating him and bargaining with him and, and doing deals with him, but because they're good for us and he wants the very best for us. And it's, I mean, I, in my mind, as he speaks these words, it's like a bubble pops and all this sort of stack of cards of argument about keeping the tank about just collapses in front of everybody. And, and it's, it's a bit like the, the story of the emperor's new clothes where the wee boy says, he hasn't got any clothes on. And everybody goes, oh, neither he has. It's that sort of moment in the synagogue that day. Jesus says, what are you doing? And he finishes with, well, the passage finishes with these words. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Last Sunday, Jared explained how the first part of Luke's gospel is focusing on what Jesus did. The second part, from the transfiguration onwards, is focusing on what he says, focusing on his teachings, and how it's important for us to listen to him, listen to him, and then respond with our lives. And so, of course, looking at this passage raises a question for us all. What is God saying to us today? What can we learn from Jesus through this passage? And, and so we'll have a minute just to reflect on that at the very end of, of this part of the service. But before that, that time comes, I think it's important for me to say that Jesus was not critical of the law of Moses. He was not critical of the Ten Commandments. He even states clearly in another part of the gospel that he came not to replace the Ten Commandments, but to fulfill them. And so I find the best way for us to understand Jesus' relationship with the Ten Commandments is to, and I find this quite helpful personally, and I hope you do too, is to think of the difference between prevention and cure. I mean, we've just undergone a pandemic where we've, we, we it very soon 
it became clear we had to come up with a prevention strategy. And it worked. But we also had to come up with cures for people who were suffering from, from COVID-19. You need both. And the Ten Commandments are God's prevention strategy. Worship me alone, he says. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet. And keep the Sabbath. You want guidance for your life? There it is. All these things are good for us. All these things are good for society. All these things are good for the world. The Pharisees' problem was that that was all they had, a prevention strategy. And if someone did not live up to the Ten Commandments, the Pharisees had nothing to offer them apart from <laughs> the equivalent of excommunication. Jesus, he also offers a cure. Jesus comes, and in his life, and in his teachings, and in his death, and in his resurrection, and in his gift of the Holy Spirit, we have the cure. We should all be trying to keep the Ten Commandments. We should all be trying to keep the Sabbath. It's good for us. But there will be times when we all mess up. We saw that this morning when asked for a show of hands. <laughs> and we mess up and we get things wrong and, and things get ruined and spoiled and we feel bad. And, and when that happens, there's no point in pretending it hasn't happened. There's no point in denying that it's happened. All Jesus asks is that we come to him and acknowledge that it's happened. Acknowledge it. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask for his healing. And he will give that freely. He's paid the price for it himself. He's offering it to us freely. And ask him to help us. That's what the gift of the Holy Spirit is all about. Ask him to help us. Say, listen, God, we can't do this on our own. We need your help. And again, that's something he will freely give. Help us in the way we live our lives. Help us in the way we interact with people. Help us in how we... Help us make society a better place. Because that's what he wants. He wants his kingdom to be evident on earth as it is in heaven. But we can't do it in our own strength. So that's where I'm going to stop. And let's just take a few moments now. And in the silence, just ask yourself, Jesus, you want me to listen. What are you saying to me today? Loving Father, we thank you that in Jesus we do have the cure. A cure that brings healing and forgiveness, a cure that works, a cure that is free for us all. Help us to accept that cure for our lives and all that's wrong in our lives. And help us to always keep in balance the truth of the gospel and the grace of the gospel not just for ourselves, but in the way we live our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.